practice exam. You will hear a number of different recordings and will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the questions and instructions and you will have a chance to check your answers. All the recordings will be played once only. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Part 1 You will hear a customer asking for help in a shop. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Excuse me, where are the dresses? They're at the end of this aisle, on the left. Can I help you with anything? Yes, maybe. I'm not from around here, so I don't know this store. Well, I can help you with anything you need. Fantastic. I'm actually down here for my brother's wedding, and I need something to wear. I've just started a new job, and I haven't had time to get anything yet. I'm looking for something smart. Maybe a new dress. Well, what about this one? I think it's too hot for long sleeves. Yes. Well, uh, this one has shorter sleeves, and it still has the bow, which I think is a nice detail. Uh, or there's this patterned one. I'm not keen on a pattern. I think I'll go for the one with the bow. Do you have it in a size 10? Let me have a look. Uh, yes, here. Great. I need a hat, and then I can try them on together. What kind of hat are you looking for? What about this one with the flower? Yes, but if I may suggest, a taller hat would add to your height. Really? Yes. Try this one. Oh, I see what you mean. We have this style with the single flower, or with a small bunch, and it comes with a, a wide or narrow brim. I like the narrow brim and just the one flower. Mm, can I have a blue flower? I'm afraid it just comes in cream. Well, it goes with the dress anyway. Great. I'll place an order and have the hat sent to you. It'll take about two days to be delivered. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. I need to take down a few details for delivery. Can I take your name? Ellen Barker. And the delivery address? It'll be my brother's address. It's 15... No, uh, 14 Brightwell Avenue. 14... Uh, can you spell that, please? Yes. B-R-I-G-H-T-W-E-L-L -L Avenue. Staybridge, Kent, D-A-4-7-D-F. And can I take a contact number? Yes, my mobile is 03221774. 03221775. No, it's a four at the end. Oh, sorry, I've got it now. We can deliver on May the 12th. We can't specify an exact time, just morning or afternoon. Any time in the early morning is fine. And how would you like to pay? Visa. Great. That comes to £32.25. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. I'm just going to try this dress on and then look for shoes. Where are the changing rooms? They're to the left of the store, right next to customer services. 
And I want some shoes and accessories too. Where can I find them? The accessories are in the women's wear department. The shoe department is right at the front of the store, between men's wear and home furnishings. Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> we've just moved the shoe department for the summer season. It's now very near the changing rooms, actually, straight in front of them. Thanks so much for your help. And where can I pay for the other things? The cash desk is at the front of the store, by the men's wear. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an introductory talk about a library. Listen and answer questions 11 to 15. You will hear part of an introductory talk about a library. Listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning. My name is Mandy and I am going to tell you a little about the John R. Jones Memorial Library here at Blackwater College. We regard the library as a gateway to the resources that you as students at the college may need. The majority of you are full-time students you may find you spend a lot of time here. Even those of you who are part-time students will no doubt require the services too. I hope that by the end of this short talk you will know the services the library has to offer, including the website and how to get any further help you may need. Oh, sorry, I forgot there may be a few distance learners on the tour today. I'll explain about the online facilities and borrowing by post scheme a little later on. This is the main site of the library, but we also have the Rivergate building and the Fieldhouse library. The Rivergate building houses the geography resources, that is the book collection and the journal collection, as well as the map collection. The hours and days of opening of the Rivergate collection are the same as this building, except that it is closed on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. The Fieldhouse Library contains a specialist collection of local history, and if you want to visit it, you will need to make an appointment. Those two facilities are the only exceptions to the rule that all the Blackwater College libraries are open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. However, to gain access to the facilities, you must have your ID card. No ID card, no entry. We have heard all the stories and excuses and we don't accept any of them. Just remember your ID card. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, I must apologise for the mess you can see around you today. Libraries should be quiet no, places, but unfortunately this 20. is not currently the case here. This new building has been here for only two months, and as a result we have not quite finished moving in. 
So far, we have moved most of the book and journal collections from the old library into this new building. There are two exceptions. We are currently moving the economics collection here, which should be installed by tomorrow, and we will be moving the French literature collection into this building next week. But as you can see, we are still building the new restaurant. Uh, we will finish it, we hope, <laughs> very shortly. We have finished the cafe, however, and students can use it during the library opening hours. We have recently installed 150 computer places and we will be adding another 100 shortly so that there will be plenty for everybody very soon. Very shortly, this library will be one of the finest in this part of the country. Don't forget that the library isn't just about academic books. In addition to the books and journals, there is a wide range of national newspapers available from the librarians on request. I'd like to mention the different ways you can get help in using our resources. Don't forget our website at www.mlbc.ac.uk. There are the full catalogues and journal access is available if you have your password and ID number. Now, any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers, successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me, then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two-thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer and only one-third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Actually, in the end, they often have both because they enjoy what they are doing. So their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake. That certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hard-working people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something, she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well, top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm, well... Would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we, came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes. Loners, who are often over-concerned about rivals, can't delegate important work or decision-making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job and learn something into the bargain too. Now, there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking about the International English Language Teaching System, IELTS. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Remember to write no more than two words or a number for each answer.
Hello everyone. Now, the International English Language Testing System exam, or IELTS as it's better known, is one of the most successful and popular English language exams in the world today. What we're going to look at now is the history of IELTS and how it came to be so successful. The story starts back in the 1960s when the British Council created an exam called EPTB to test international applicants wanting to study at universities and colleges in the UK. EPTB, by the way, stood for English Proficiency Test Battery. Strange name, I know. This exam mainly used multiple choice questions and by the end of the 1970s was considered a little old fashioned. So, in 1980, it was replaced by ELTS, the English Language Testing Service. This new exam was much more modern in approach. It was much more communicative, for example, and was intended to reflect how language was used in the real world, particularly in the academic context of universities and colleges. However, during the 1980s, the number of candidates taking the test was quite low. For example, only 4,000 people took the test in 1981. It's true that this had risen to 10,000 by 1985, but if you compare that to the number of candidates who take IELTS each year these days, more than a million, you can see why they considered it to be quite small. There were also some practical problems with the test. So, in 1987, it was decided to conduct a review, leading to a revised version of the exam. This was introduced in 1989 under its new name, IELTS. Over the next few years, the number of candidates increased rapidly. In 1995, there were over 43,000 candidates and it was possible to take the test in any one of 210 test centres around the world. 1995 was also the year of the next revision to the exam, which simplified the reading module and also improved exam administration. Further minor changes followed. The speaking module was altered in 2001 and the criteria for marking the writing tasks were revised in 2005. In the same year, a computerised version of the exam was offered at certain test centres. 2003 was a milestone for IELTS as it was the year when the number of candidates went over half a million for the first time. There's no doubt that today, with, as we said, a candidature more than double what it was back in 2003, IELTS is a major player in the highly competitive industry of English language examinations. That is you the now end of have part half four. a minute to check your answers.